What's going on? We are back on Small Ball. Uh, it's a Monday. We have not had a show since the MLB draft. We will be getting into a lot of MLB draft coverage today and for the rest of the week. More on that in a second. Thanks for joining us here. Um, as you can see, we got a fan going on in the background, and there's another fan uh, on the other side of the room because it is a little bit uh, a little bit steamy in here. So if you can't hear me that well, let me know, and I will try to make some adjustments. But again, it is a Monday. Thank you for being here. A lot of MLB draft stuff to cover, as well as a uh, the return of an old segment. More on that in a second. I'm going to notify the world that we're live. Again, thanks so much for being here. So, the MLB draft was, uh, I guess now it was over uh, over a week and a half ago, um, and we didn't get to we didn't get to break it down. You know, we we did some uh, we had some time off, and a lot of stuff I want to talk about, and we're going to get right into that here as I notify the world we're live. But man. So here we go. I'm going to start by saying this. Every year I get really, really excited for the draft, right? The MLB draft. One of my favorite days, or I guess a couple days, uh, in, in, in every year. It's a lot of fun. I get super into it. It's, 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 it's just very interesting to me. But every year... This year, more so than others, I watched the draft. I was actually watching it uh, from the car. The, I was watching day one from the car, and I watched a little bit of day one at home. But I was watching MLB Network's coverage of it. And I, I, I'm astounded. I really, like, I must be missing something. Because there are 30 teams each of which have a general manager, an assistant general manager, a team of scouts. And I am astounded. I must be missing something. It must be me because as I watch these picks go by and by, I almost feel like somebody is doing a mock draft trying to make the oddest picks, the most obscure, most unreasonable picks humanly possible. And I will get more down to the specifics in a bit. But my takeaway, my major takeaway from this draft, more so than others and others as well, is there are a lot of teams that did not capitalize on opportunities to acquire top-level young talent. Again, it must be me, right? Because these guys are professionals. They supposedly know what they're doing. They have teams of people. And I saw 10 to 15, probably, I'd say 10, maybe 15 players go in the first round that I could almost unequivocally say right now will never be an above average player on a major league team. Like it just seems too obvious to me to be true. Because if it was that obvious, obviously they wouldn't be making these picks. And I'll get into my specifics on that in a bit. But that's that's what was replaying in my head throughout this first round especially, was what are they thinking? And I did like a lot of the picks, obviously, but a lot of wasted opportunities on players that just simply aren't going to be very good. And it's, you know, we talk about ceiling and floor, right? And we'll get into that in a bit. I'm not, like, literally guys that I don't even... I can't even rate on the ceiling floor scale because I can't see them being productive major league players. Nonetheless, we're not going to do draft grades today. That will be coming later in the week. 
I'm going to go through and I'm going to grade each team's draft. Uh, what I first want to do today is I'm going to get into my, we just talked about ceiling and floor. I'm going to give you a ceiling and a floor for every player taken in the first round. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to give you my top 10 best players from this draft class. More on that when we get to it. But here we go. And after this is over, we're going to bring back uh, an old segment that you guys really, really like. So here we go. I'm going to give you a ceiling and a floor. Ceiling being if everything goes well, if everything works out, what is the most that this player could be? What is their absolute max potential? And, and floor being, you know, no breaks, right? What is the absolute worst they can be, right? And, and that varies depending on the player. And, and obviously, we'll talk about that in a second. For some guys, it might not even be, in my opinion, breaking into the big leagues. And for other guys with higher floors, you know, you can look for a guy that isn't necessarily going to be a superstar, but you, you really can't see him busting and just completely bombing out um, and providing no value. So here we go. Starting it off with the Tigers, Spencer Torkelson. Look, you guys know, if you've seen my show before, that I would not have taken him first overall. Um, a lot of people are under, you know, under the school of thought that you kind of had to do it just because of his numbers, right? His potential. And I think there's admittedly a pretty low floor. For me, his floor is a perennial KBO all-star. What I, what I mean by that is he's going to get every opportunity in the world, right? First overall picks, first round picks in general, but especially first overall picks. However good or bad they may be, they are going to get every break. They are going to get the utmost attention given to them by the development department. Um, they are going to get every you know excuse in the book to try to help them come into their own and reach their fullest potential. Spencer Torkelson's floor is very low for a first overall pick. Very low. I can see his floor being a guy who it really just doesn't work out for, and he goes to play somewhere else. I honestly don't – I would not be shocked if he's out of Major League Baseball in five years. I just don't think that he has the hand-eye coordination to catch up to top-level velocity. I think he is an ex extremely strong and powerful young man. But with Wood, I'm not sure his swing has enough torque, enough flexibility, enough dynamic strength um, and athleticism to generate enough power with Wood. And defensively, we all understand that he might struggle tremendously. His ceiling is, is a home run derby champ. And what I mean by that is I can't see him being certainly a five-tool player. I can't even really see him being a balanced player, right? If he's a productive major league player, it's all going to come from his, his bat, mostly from his power. I think at his best, he could have average contact rates, swing and miss rates, average. And in the power department, I think he could be a, a 35 home run guy. But I think he's going to be more show than dough, if you know what I mean. I think he's going to be, at his best, big bopper, home run derby type guy, right? You know, you come to the ballpark to see him hit the ball really far. But from the perspective of winning ball games, I, I, don't, I, I just don't think that he is going to be good enough in those other areas to compensate 
Um, you know, I, I think at his best, his overall offensive profile is very good, not great. And defensively, he's going to struggle. So overall, his ceiling is more exciting than actually winning ball games. And his floor is um, he's out of the league in five years. Now I spent a lot of time on that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go a lot more quickly. Um, but obviously, first overall pick, probably you know one of the more important ones to talk about. Now Heston Kerstad, complete reach, right? And I give the Orioles credit for being aggressive, but I just don't like the player. Um, you know, no disrespect to to Kerstad. I think that he is a stereotypical good college hitter who is very good against college level pitching defensively. He's average at best. And I don't think that his, his swing, his offensive makeup is, is crafty enough is, um, you know, I just, I just don't think that it's adaptable. I think that when he takes that next step to the next level, I don't see him really being able to adapt that swing, and I think he'll need to. So his floor, again, I think at his worst, I don't, I don't think he's a major league player because I think that I, I just don't see him being able to evolve his swing, and defensively, he could struggle mightily. He doesn't really have a position right now. At his best, at his ceiling, I'd consider him to be a good player. Um, you know, I think offensively, 25, 30 home runs. Don't see him hitting for high average, 250 probably. And defensively, if he finds a home, I think he could be adequate, definitely adequate. I see him as a good everyday player at his best, not an all-star. Um, but a productive, um, replaceable, but good player at his best. Heston Kerstad. Max Meyer. I love this pick by the Marlins. Um, you know, I could definitely see them going with the safe pick of Austin Martin, who we'll get to later. But I like the aggressiveness. Max Meyer, at his worst, could struggle. I'll admit that. His command is not always all there. And there's this, there's this sentiment for some reason when you talk about pitching prospects in the draft. There's always this thing called reliever risk, which means if he doesn't pan out, he might turn into a reliever. I've never really seen that as a risk. Relievers are very important, obviously, um, pieces of a major league roster. I'm not really sure why being demoted, if you will, to a relief role is necessarily a downside. But I do see a lot of reliever risk here. His command is not always there, but he does have the makeup to compensate for it. He's definitely a major league arm, in my opinion. But I think at his worst, if he continues to struggle with his command, he's an undersized um, you know, guy for somebody who throws that hard. I think the big risk for him is arm trouble. I think at his at his floor, um, you know, at his worst, I can see him being a middle reliever, productive, but middle reliever who maybe if his arm wears down a little bit, doesn't quite have the velo that he has now at 21. So I could see him being a uh, sixth, seventh inning guy, maybe off Tommy John. Right, the velo's there right now. It might not always be, but he has the makeup to almost guarantee himself as a productive reliever. And at his best, he's an ace. He's absolutely an ace at his ceiling. Um, I honestly think that he could be at his ceiling a top five pitcher in the game. The stuff is there. The makeup is there. Makeup to me is the most important thing. What makeup traditionally is competitiveness, you know, pitchability, um, understanding of pitching, right? Um, you know, more confidence, morale, intangibles, that kind of stuff. You guys know I love that stuff. 
it's rare to find a guy with his makeup and his um and his stuff at this age because a lot of times you know less mature uh athletes when they have electric stuff or in you know in any other sport just incredible physical abilities they don't always necessarily need to be um you know fundamentally sound in the intangible department to get high school hitters out let's say but he has both doesn't have the control right now but he's athletic um i like his delivery and i think at his best that's all it's going to take for him is is a little bit better uh command and control to be a top five pitcher in in the game now asa lacy um this is a guy that i've liked for for quite some time also has Tremendous makeup. Um, the top left-handed pitcher taken in the draft by the, uh, the you know, by the uh, Royals. I don't think his ceiling is quite as high as others. I do think his floor is tremendously high. Um, I think his floor is a number three starter because he has a very repeatable, efficient delivery. He is a big, strong kid. I don't really worry about arm problems. Um, he's got three to four above average offerings, um, fastball, curveball, slider, changeup. He's got more than enough velo to get by, right? He sits 95 to even cranks it up to 97. So I think at his worst, he's a number three. I can't really see him bombing out. He's athletic, he's strong, um, and he knows how to pitch. And I think at his best, I think he's actually a number two. You know, I don't really see him as – a lot of people see him as a top, top level – arm in this game. I think on a bad team, he could maybe be a one, but I see him as more of a two. Um, I, I don't think he's going to be a workhorse. I don't, you know, I don't love his, um, his stamina. I think that, you know, he has four good solid offerings, but none of his pitches are plus plus. And I can't really see any of them making that jump. Right, you know, I think velo wise, he's kind of at his at his max. Um, you know, he he doesn't have tremendous life on his breaking pitches. Um, they are very solid. He has good com- good command, not impeccable command. You know, I think he's kind of what he's going to be, and I think you know he's very safe. And I don't think his ceiling is low by any stretch, but I don't think it's quite as high as a lot of people think. I think he's a number three at his worst, a number two, maybe a you know a, a low level ace on like a really a really bad team um, at his best. Austin Martin, one of the safest picks in the draft at his floor. Honestly, you know I think he's a you know a leadoff hitter, number two hitter at his floor at his worst. Um, athleticism, coordination, talent, you know just the, the talent the character, the intangibles. I can't envision a scenario in which he's not a productive player on any team in America in a couple of years. You know, I think at his worst, he'll hit 265, 270 at his worst. There's just way too many things that he does well for him to not contribute on a major league roster. At his best, Obviously, the ceiling is not incredible. He reminds me a lot of Dansby Swanson right here, coming out of Vandy, shortstop from Vandy, you know, a five-tool guy that knows how to win, right, knows how to, to, how to lead a team, but isn't going to, you know, get out the tape measure, right, isn't going to, um, you know, doesn't have a rocket arm, but very sound. I think that his ceiling – is a a low level all star. I think he could definitely be an all star, um, but I, I can't see him being you know silver slugger, gold glove. I just think he's so good at so many things that his floor is a two sixty five two seventy lead off or or two hitter with good defense, very good defense, not impeccable, but good. And at his best. I think he's a top 10 shortstop defensively. I think he's a level all-star. Now Emerson Hancock, quite the opposite. 
at his worst, he's not a major league talent. Um, he's too inconsistent. He is too dependent on his stuff. He's shown so, you know, flashes of brilliance, right? Dominating top level SEC teams. Emerson Hancock from Georgia. But getting rocked by some not so good teams, it the inconsistency. And if we worry about that at the college level, that just magnifies itself at the pro level and then the major league level. At his worst, he's not a major league talent. His command is not there. His stuff is good in college. It will not overpower major league hitters if it doesn't get better. At his best, I think he's a reliever. I can't really see him working out as a starter. I don't think he has the um, that workhorse ability. I think he's too inconsistent. I see him at his best as a setup man at the back end of a bullpen. Because... Like I said, I think that I worry about his composure at times, honestly. He does have the stuff, and if the stuff ramps up, I think he could be a setup guy. But here's the, an interesting point that a lot of people don't really think about. You have a guy with really, really good college stuff and mediocre college command, right? It's okay. In this situation, right, when you have to improve both, Right, Max Meyer right now has now stuff and mediocre command. He's going to be able now to develop. Obviously, his stuff will even get a little bit better as he gets more matures, more physically mature and strong. But he's going to be able to hone in on his command. Emerson Hancock, I think, needs to take a step up in his command and his stuff if he wants to be you know, a sixth overall pick level player. And that's not as easy as it seems, right? To work on both of those facets of your game while competing at the pro level, while trying to prove yourself as a productive pro player to move up the ranks. When you have to improve multiple aspects of your game, that worries me a little bit. So at his worst, he's not a major league talent at his best. I see him being a setup man. I don't see him being a, a productive starter in this league. Nick Gonzalez, his floor. Now, I like Nick Gonzalez. Very similar to Austin Martin in that he does so many different things well. But I don't think he is quite the athlete that Austin Martin is. I think at his worst... You know, I think he bounces in and out of the minor leagues and the major leagues. I, I can't see him bombing, right? I definitely think that he will get a shot at the major league level. But I could definitely see him being a bench-type bat, you know, a defensive replacement maybe. You know, I think it's a similar situation to Hancock in a way where his power does need to improve. And his hit tool is excellent in college. But I think against top-level arms – you know, he's not the biggest guy. I think that I think that kind of both his hit tool and power tool kind of need to improve a little bit. He's a good athlete, not great. I think at his worst, he's a bench bat, and at his best, and I consider that to be a high ceiling, by the way. I think anybody who I really do think is going to be you know, a major league talent, I think that's a high ceiling because in baseball, you know, it's a lot more efficient. Drafting is a lot more precise than it used to be. But you never know. There's a lot of guys that just never are able to produce at a major league level. So it sounds like I'm ripping Nick Gonzalez right now by saying that he's going to be a bench bat. I think that's a good floor to have. His ceiling is not that high, admittedly. Um, there's just too many things that he has to improve upon because similar to Austin Martin, he does a lot of things well but doesn't do anything stellarly, I think. Um, and Austin Martin's just a step, uh, just a step a a ahead of Nick Gonzalez. So I think at his best, he's like an eight hitter, second baseman, right, with above average defense, um, 
you know, and a guy that can get on base, right? But that's that's about it, right? He's not going to be a big bopper. I don't think he's going to be a 300 hitter. I think at his best, he's an everyday starter in the eight spot at second base, Nick Gonzalez for the Pirates from New Mexico State. Now, Robert Hassel the third. I see some bust potential here. I think that his floor is a not is not a major league talent. I just think that he's not particularly um, physically mature right now, and I think he's shown signs of obviously being an excellent player, the first high school player taken in the draft. But you know, I just when I see these high school players, especially that really aren't at their peak yet in terms of their athletic ability. There is a lot of potential to, as he starts to move up the ranks into pro ball, into the big leagues, so many things change. And I just don't think we have a great sense of what kind of player Robert Hassel III is because he's dominating high school arms. But I just think he's going to change so much as an athlete and as a player. And I think there are some holes. I think he's a very, very, very strong offensive player. Defensively, I think he could be anywhere from bad to pretty good. I think he has a very big defensive range. Offensively, again, good, but he's dominating high school arms and just I think a lot is going to change for him. And I, I can see him not working out. At his best, at his ceiling, honestly, I think he's an eight hitter. Because I don't think he's an incredible athlete. And as those changes start to occur, I, I don't see him getting a lot better. I think he could be an adequate outfielder defensively and an eight hitter. Robert Hassel the third for the Padres. Now, Zach Veen, this is a guy that a lot of people really like, and that magnified itself when he got picked by the Rockies. That's not going to change my opinion about him. At his floor, he's not a major league talent. I, you know, again, high school hitter, dominating, you know, the circuit, dominating high school arms. But I don't think he is a tremendous dynamic athlete. A lot of people love his athleticism because he has big pop for someone his size. He can run, but I don't love his adjustability. I don't think at his worst that he's a major league talent at his best. It's tough. Similar to Robert Hassel, the third, and this isn't just like a high school bat thing or a high school player thing in general. I think they too in particular are a little bit, they have some maturing to do as athletes. And I think at Zach Veen's absolute best, I think he's a six hitter because, you know, I think there's a lot of swing and miss potential. I think that his power right now plays up, you know, compared to his peers, but he's never going to be a huge guy, right? He's, I don't think he's ever going to be a home run hitter at the major league level. Um, so I think he's a six hitter. And at his best, I think he could be a very good outfielder, but a very big range. I don't love his defensive instincts. He's athletic, and I think he can make it work. At his worst, he's not a major league talent. At his best, I think that he is a six hitter with plus defense. Now, Reed Detmers, I didn't love this pick. I think his floor is also not a major league talent because – there are a lot of things that he has to improve. His command is okay, but not good enough to make up for his lack of stuff. And at his best, I just can't see him dominating Major League bats. I think he could be a really good workhorse lefty. Um, I think an innings eater. I think a number four level arm. Somebody who gets outs but is not overpowering. Um, and his command, you know, it isn't excellent. So, you know, it's not a guy that's going to carve you up, eat up, you know, eat open the strike zone. 
I think he's a four at best and a bust at worst. Now, Garrett Crochet, I like. And I especially like, um, you know, the fit here in, in Chicago. I think that at his worst, I do see a little bust potential, but I really like Garrett Crochet. I think he has a really good balance of pitchability, stuff, and command. None are superb, but all are very good. At his worst, I think he could be I think I definitely could see him being a reliever, actually, but I think at his worst, he's probably a number five starter. Um, I think he's gonna be a productive starting pitcher at the major league level. I just I, I just think that he does too many things well to not be a major league starter. And at his best, I think he's a two. I really like his ceiling. Um he does a lot of things well, and pitchability is the biggest thing, right? And once that's there, everything else kind of falls into place. He's a lefty with good but not great stuff, but I think he has a little bit of a funky delivery. I think he could be very crafty, and I think if you pair that with a tick up in his stuff, I think his command is already good enough to get him through the minor leagues, and I think he could be a number two at best. I do. Austin Hendrick. Big time range. Um, at his worst, see, this is tough because he's not really a bench bat, right? Because defensively, you know, typically bench bats are a little bit more adequate defensively to use late in games and what have you. He's not going to be an, you know, an excellent defensive outfielder. But I can see him at his worst being a bench bat. I can't really see him busting. His offensive talent is really, really good. Um, he has a lot of pop, a lot of strength for his size. So I would say at his worst, he's probably, it's tough because he doesn't profile as a bench bat, but I do, I can see him being worse than a starter. Um, but I, you know, it's tough. This is a really tough one. Actually, I would say his floor is probably, like a platoon guy, maybe, right? Um, you know, platoon him, you know, against righties, take him out against lefties at his worst. Now, his ceiling is high, really high. I think his ceiling is, you know, a number two or a number five hitter, depending on the, you know, the lineup. Offensively, really, really high ceiling. He has really, really good um, coordination. Really good pop for his size. The one you know downside right now is his swing and miss rate, but I do have confidence that he can actually fix that. I think at his best, he's like a 280 hitter, 30 bombs, good speed. Uh, you know, for somebody with that much power, and defensively, he'll be average at best. But I think he's an average defender with very good offense, five hitter, two hitter. Probably not a three or four, but five or two. Now, Patrick Bailey, I don't really know what to think about Patrick Bailey. I like Patrick Bailey as a college prospect. I don't think he's a major league starting catcher. Um, at his worst, he's a backup. I don't think he's going to bust. I think he is very good with the mental, you know, the mental game. He's a good defender offensively he's you know your standard backup at his worst i think but i just think his intangibles are too strong to completely bust at his best though i think he's like a bottom 10 maybe even bottom five i'll go with bottom 10 starting catcher in the league um i can't really see him being an above average starting catcher i don't think his offensive ceiling is really high at all i don't really see anything that jumps off the page, you know, about his offense. And I think his defense, I think, is solid. The intangibles are very good, not excellent. And I just think that his, you know, tangible defensive skills are adequate at best. Um, so I can see him being a good game manager with solid defense and a 230 hitter, 240 hitter. I think at his best, he's a bottom 10 starting catcher, and at his worst, he's a backup. 
Now, Justin Foscue, big time floor, big time floor. I think at his worst, honestly, he's a starting second baseman on a bad team at his absolute worst. I can't really see him not being a starting level player. Um, I think he's very physically and mentally mature. Um, I think he's very dependable. I think he's very consistent. I think I know if I draft Justin Foscue that I'm getting what I see, right? There's a lot of prospects that we really don't know. I think Justin Foscue has shown us the type of player that he can be. And I think that he's a very good representation right now of what he will be in the future, which means that his ceiling won't be tremendously high. But I think at his worst, at his floor, he's a starting second baseman on a bad team. At his best, he's a starting second baseman on an okay team. I think Justin Fosu is a safe bet to be a starting second baseman, but that's about it. I don't think he's going to hit for power. I think he'll hit 250 to 260 defensively. He's more sound than he is athletic. And I think he can be an average both defender and offensive player at best. And at his worst, he's a guy that can you can depend on defensively. And he's going to get on base, but that's about it. Now, Mick Abel, I can see him busting. His floor is not a high school player. Um, a lot of people like his ceiling. I don't love it. Because right now, similar situation actually to Emerson Hancock. His stuff is above his command and control. And he needs to improve both. So that's why I can see him busting. And at his best... I think he's a three. I don't see him any higher than a three. I don't love his breaking pitches. I don't think they're necessarily out pitches. I think they are okay. They can be plus, but I don't think he'll have a wipeout breaking ball. I don't think his fastball will be good enough to compensate for that. So I think he's a three. Mick Abel for the Phillies. Justin Foskey for the Rangers, by the way, and Patrick Bailey for the Giants. I keep forgetting to name these teams. Austin Hendrick. For the Reds. Now, Ed Howard, drafted by the Cubs. I loved this pick. A lot of people saw it coming. Ed Howard from Chicago, played on that Chicago Little League World Series team when he was a kid. At his worst, he is a defensive replacement shortstop. At his absolute worst, he is a very good defender at his absolute worst. Offensively, I can definitely see the question marks here. Um, you know, I, I think that he could definitely have well below average power, and his swing and miss rate for somebody with, you know, not great power is a little bit high. So I can see him being a guy that you bring in late in games to play defense at his worst. At his best, he is a solid starting shortstop, an average starting shortstop with superb defense. I think at his best, he's the top three defensive shortstop. I think he's a gold glove level shortstop at his best. Offensively, I can't really see him being much better than average, but I see him as like an Andrelton Simmons type, and we'll get to comps later in the week. But I think his defense is too good to bust. I think he'll be productive, you know, on any in any situation defensively. Um, and I think at his best, he's a gold glover with 250 – right? 15 bombs. You know, all you need, if he, if he's average offensively and he reaches his defensive potential, he's a very productive player. His offense isn't going to be terrific. Isn't going to be terrific. Um, but his defense is really going to make him, um, a valuable, a valuable player at the major league, major league level. And his intangibles are outstanding. I really, really like his, uh, into his intangibles especially now coming into this Cubs organization, growing up in Chicago, Chicago area. Um, I, th I think that he can be the leader of this team. So his intangibles actually carry his, uh, his ceiling to another level. Now, Nick York, definitely one of the most surprising picks of the first round, um, was not projected to really even go in the top three rounds or anything close to it coming into the draft at his worst, he's not a major league level player. And at his best, in my opinion, 
I, I'm trying to figure out how to say this without being harsh. I honestly just cannot see him being a major league level talent. Um, he doesn't do anything outstandingly well. There's way too much that he has to improve, I think, to be productive. I think at his worst, he's like a – I mean, at his best, he's like a bench bat. Maybe a starting second baseman on one of the worst teams in the league. I'll go that far. I'll say he's a bottom five second baseman at best, and he's a bust at worst. I just don't think he does anything particularly well for the Red Sox. Now, Bryce Jarvis for the Diamondbacks. It's interesting. I kind of like Bryce Jarvis. There's a lot that he needs to improve. I think he's very inconsistent. Um, you know, that's that's the big thing, the big downside, um, you know, for me. His dad was a big league pitcher, Kevin Jarvis. I think, you know, ACC pedigree, he's shown flashes of excellent command, excellent command. But he's also struggled at times. So I think he could actually bust. I could see him busting at his worst, but at his best, I think he could be a low two, a high three. Um, you know, a, a two on a bad team, a three on a good team. I think that he's going to be a major league talent, a productive major league player, probably close to average. I think he has a pretty big range. I think he could bust, and I think that he could be a, a two on some teams. Um, cause he's shown flashes of brilliance, superb command, pretty good stuff. Just hasn't really been able to string it together consistently. I think that's, you know, what's going to make or break his career is consistency. And I think if he can figure that out, he's a two on some teams, but if he can't, he's a bust. Now, Pete Crow Armstrong at his worst defensive replacement. I think he's a superb defensive outfielder, really good speed. Um, I can see him being a bust offensively, but his defense is too good for him not to produce in some role at the major league level. And at his best, I think he's a starting outfielder, a seven hitter. He does not profile as somebody who's going to hit for a lot of power. And I think at his best, he's like a 260 guy. His strikeout rate's a little high for somebody with that low power. Pete Crow Armstrong for the Mets. I think his ceiling is a seven hitter. And a very good defender, very good defender. Um, and at his worst, he's a defensive replacement. Garrett Mitchell for the Brewers. Garrett Mitchell um, has been playing with type 1 diabetes since he was in third grade. A lot of people are scared off by that. I think that he is an all around really good talent, six tool player, all five tools plus the intangibles. Um, a lot of people are scared off by his medical concerns um but to this point excuse me my eye is itching like crazy right now to this point he's more than made it work um an outstanding player at ucla brewers now drafted him in the first round at his worst i can see him kind of busting but really good speed i can see him being like a pinch runner defensive replacement but not really an amazing defender at his worst i think he's a bench player probably like a pinch runner type player. And at his best, I think he's an all-star. I really do. He does a lot of things well. I think he's a six to a player. I see him as a leader. I see him as a very balanced player, both offensively and defensively. And I think Garrett Mitchell has a, a pretty wide range. I don't think he's a really has any potential to be a complete bust. I think at his worst, he's a pinch runner. And at his best, he's an all-star. Jordan Walker for the, uh, for the Cardinals. One of the biggest ranges, probably the biggest range we're going to talk about today. At his worst, he's not going to be able to hit big league pitching at his worst. Um, he's young. He's 18. 6'5", 230, monster pop, rocket arm, fundamentally not very sound. So if as he changes his swing, this is like a Gary Sanchez kind of situation here. Right now, he has a swing that works at the high school level. He's going to have to change that, obviously. If he can be athletic enough, coordinated enough, I don't love his coordination. He's athletic, very athletic. I don't love his hand-eye coordination, but if it improves or is better than I think, and he is athletic enough, 
to adjust his swing without losing some of that pop. A lot of guys can't do that. He might be one of them. And if he is, he'll bust. If he's not one of them and he can adjust that swing, honestly, I'm not sure Silver Slugger is quite where he could be. I, but I think he, I'm going to go with Silver Slugger at third base. I think he could really be a productive offensive player. And I think defensively he's not very sound, but he has a really strong throwing arm. Um, and I think he could be average or maybe even a tick above average defensively, offensively. He could hit 40 home runs and he could hit 290. Jordan Walker for the Cardinals. I think he could be a silver slugger, definitely an all-star at best, and a bust at worst. Cade Cavalli, Oklahoma. This is one of those situations where drafted by the Nationals, I'm just like, what like what am I missing right now? At his worst, he's a bust. He does not have a lot of um, experience. He's been hurt. He has some, you know, injury concerns. He's pretty big, though. At his worst, he's a bust. At his best, I don't know. I think he is a long reliever at his best. Can't see him being a productive starter. Just too many injury concerns. Not going to be a workhorse. And I don't think he has the stuff to dominate major league hitters. So I think he's like a long reliever at his best innings eater in the bullpen. Cade Cavalli for the Nationals. Carson Tucker for the Indians. He's got a brother in the big leagues. So I think it is worst. He's an athletic bench bat who can hit left-handed pitching who can play a little bit of defense and can run a little bit. But he doesn't do anything superbly. I keep I keep going on that superb track, but there's not really an adjective for it. Um, but I don't think he does anything particularly well. So I think that his worst, he's a major league player, but a bench player. At his best, he's a middle infielder on a bad team. I don't think he's going to be, you know, tremendous. But I think if he does... You know, if he improves each part of his game a little bit, he can do a lot of things pretty well. Carson Tuck. Now, Nick Bitsko, at his worst, complete bust. Um, I think he dominates high school hitters. And I worry at the next level if he has the makeup, the, I don't know the word for it really, the competitive, I mean, he's competitive, but I don't think that he has the adjustability. The flexibility, not physical flexibility, but um, you know, just the flexibility of his of his repertoire. I don't think he's going to be able to adjust his arm, or rather, his um, you know, just his his talent that much, um, and still keep that velo, that you know, good spin. A lot of scouts love him because of the analytics, the spin rate, all that. I'm not for that stuff. Um, I think it is worse. He's a complete. Boston. At his best, I think he's a productive reliever. I don't see him being a, a workhorse starter in the big leagues. This is like a stereotypical dominates high school bats, but uh, relies too much on very good but not excellent stuff to really dominate big league hitters. But if his stuff is, you know, really takes a step up. I think he could be a really solid reliever, not a, not an excellent reliever, but a very solid one with command that's average at best. Jared Schuster for the uh, for the Braves, a big time reach. I don't hate the pick, but I do think he could bust at his worst. At his best, he's an innings eating number four on a bad team, five on a good team starter, lefty uh, from Wake Forest for the Braves. I just don't see a really high ceiling here. There's nothing that he does really well, but he eats innings. He's mature. He throws a lot of strikes. His command isn't excellent, but his control is very good. Command being, you know, control in the strike zone and control being control out of the strike zone. So I think that he's at his best a four or a five. And at his worst, he's a bust because I just think that his stuff might not pan out. Um, to be able to get major league hitters out consistently. Tyler Soderstrom, another 
questionable pick for the A's here. At his best, he is an absolute – I mean, excuse me, at his worst, he is an absolute bust. Tyler Schoderstrom is a catching prospect that did not start at catcher on his high school team. Think about that. When I'm drafting a catcher, I want a future athletic defensive backstop. I do not want a guy who most likely will not catch at the major league level. Think about that. He's a DH offensively. At his absolute worst, he's a complete bust who can't play any position and strikes out way too much. At his best, he has a lot of offensive potential, but he does not have a position. At his best, I think he could be a below-average outfielder with a good bat, but he's going to strike out a pretty significant amount. Right? He has a big-time bat with serious exit velo, but his mechanics aren't great. Swing and miss is a little bit high. I think at his best... He's a average all-around player with below average defense and a 270 hitter with 25 home runs at his absolute best. So maybe like a six, maybe a five hitter with below average defense. And at his worst, he's a complete bust because he, he, he can't catch. That's for sure. Um, you know, no disrespect there, but he doesn't have a position and his swing and miss is pretty high. Aaron Sabato, this one doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. Twins, first baseman out of North Carolina. At his worst, he's a bust because, you know, he's he's big, right? A little bit clunky. Um, defensively, he could really struggle. I mean, his freshman year in college, he hit 186. So the upside here is more of a talent thing, right? More than a production thing, which I I like. He's only a sophomore. So I think he could bust because we haven't really seen enough consistent, you know, enough consistent production out of Aaron Sabato. And at his best, I can see him being a slightly below average defender. I can't really see him having a great bat. I really can't. I think he's like a seven hitter at best. At best. I don't think he's a major league talent, though. And below average defense either way. Now, oh my goodness gracious. Look. You probably could have guessed that I thought the Yankees should have taken a catch. Because of their current catching situation, I do not want to get into that right now. And they did take a catcher, but they took Austin Wells. Austin Wells from Arizona. This is the stereotypical bust. He is an unathletic catcher with okay offense, good offense, sure. But as a major league prospect, really? Little to no athleticism. I think at his worst, he is an absolute bust defensively and a bust offensively. And at his best, he's like a Gary Sanchez. I mean, no, I mean, not even really. I mean, he at his best, he'll be able to hit adequately and he's not going to be a great defender. So he's like a bad defensive backstop, maybe DH. I think at his best, he's like a he's like a backup catcher who can't catch, right, and is just there to bring some semblance of offense. Um, I can't really see him being a major league talent. I really can't. Um, I'm trying to come up with something, some scenario in which he'd be a starting catcher. I'd say at his absolute best, he is a – slightly above average offensive catcher who you need to replace or would like to replace late in games defensively and isn't going to work out after three or four years. Now, Bobby Miller um, for the Dodgers, you know, it's a pretty safe pick. I think that he has a really 
solid floor. Um, I think his absolute floor is bounces in and out of the minors. But I, I can see him being more of a reliever, a, a productive reliever. Um, you know, his ceiling's not that high, right? He doesn't have the stuff. His command is okay. He looks a lot like Walker Bueller, just, you know, his physical just looks like him, which is encouraging, I guess. Um, but he doesn't have the stuff. I think he'll be like a long reliever. Um, he's a big kid, 6'5", 220. But he's from Louisville, uh, you know, University of Louisville. I can see him at his best being like a long reliever or maybe like a five, maybe a four, but more of an innings eater than, you know, lights out kind of guy. Um, I don't know. He sits 95, 96. I think he's going to come down from that a little bit, honestly. Maybe sit more 94, 95. He's touched 99. But I just, I just don't think his his uh, his delivery is repeatable. He does have a, a nice heavy sinking fastball, which I think could play nicely in a long relief role, or maybe a a five, maybe even a four on a bad team. I think at his worst, he bounces in and out of the minors as a reliever, maybe a low level starter, and at his best, he's like a long reliever, decent long reliever, or a five, maybe even a four. And to wrap it up, Jordan Westberg. For the Orioles from Mississippi State, I like this pick a lot. I think the, the ceiling is high. I think as his floor, he's a bust. You know, let's be honest. I think at his floor, he might bust. Um, his swing and miss is a little bit high. His defense, similar to Foscu, both from Mississippi State, more fundamentally sound than, you know, dynamically athletic. So... I don't know if he's going to be athletic enough to play at the major league level. No disrespect there. Um, but at his worst, he's a bust. And at his best, I think he could be very good. I think he could be an average starting middle infielder. I don't know if he's athletic enough to play short. I see him as like a Ben Zobris type, maybe even like a utility guy. I, I could see him learning how to play a, you know, a corner spot, maybe even third. I think he has a very good baseball IQ. The athleticism isn't terrific. It's all, it, you know, it's okay, right? He's, he's a first-round pick. But at his worst, he's a bust. And at his best, he's an average 260 hitter with versatility defensively, but no position that he really shines at. So, a, you know, maybe slightly below average to average all-around defender that can move around a little bit. And that's going to wrap it up. That took a very, very long time. Um, so we don't have time for the other segment, which was going to be manager grades for the AL West. Maybe I'll do that later in the week or save it for next Monday. But thanks again for tuning in. That'll do it for today's show. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, recommend if you feel inclined to do any of those things or all of those things. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed my floors and ceilings for this year's first round. Um, we'll be back at it tomorrow. Thursday might be a bit tricky. I'll, I'll More on that in a bit. But thanks for watching. Have a healthy, happy, happy, and safe uh, rest of your Monday. Have a good one. Thanks for watching. Peace.